I'll find out all the necessary information and uh, I'll get back to you regarding the, the change in topics or no change in topics for uh, the assignments or the memoir in case you decide to do it later in uh, you know, the June session or something. I shall absolutely clarify it with the authorities. So, ah, Sushanji, there's Professor Mishra. Uh, we shall get down to talking, talking about this. Uh, oh, well, uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, sir make a brief introduction and then I shall leave the stage to sir. Uh, very good afternoon, Professor Sushant Kumar Mishra. Uh, dear students of MAFL, over the last few months, we have spent a considerable time trying to learn new things and completing the courses of the MA first year at SOFL IGNU. And as we all have learned, over the months. A lot of it is credited to self-learning as you've all seen. However, it would be impossible to negate the importance of the many teachers who have joined us from time to time and their contribution has been precious, immensely valuable. And uh, you all have learned so much from the different teachers from across the country who've been with us at different points of time. Today, I'm delighted, absolutely honored to have with us Professor Sushant Kumar Mishra, Professor of French Studies and former chairperson of the Center of French and Francophone Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. He is presently on deputation to the Nalanda International University at the School of Language, Literatures and Humanities. Uh, it is uh, it's quite an honor to introduce my senior at the university as well as my colleague for a, for a long number of years. Professor Mishra is, is a man of many talents and he's a known scholar in the field of not only French studies, but linguistics and translation studies as well. He's a polyglot, knows a lot of foreign languages from the best. What I remember, he knows uh, Spanish, Greek, Portuguese, and Arabic, and might be some more that I don't know of. And he's deeply into studies on the Indian knowledge systems and Sanskrit. So presently, as I said, he's on deputation to the Nalanda University, and he's contributing immensely to all fields of linguistics, Sanskrit studies, translation, French studies, many such. And we are delighted to have him here today with us. He'll be handling the units, some of the units, important ones in linguistics. Your course MFL 001. Uh, before I hand him over at the stage, a little uh, reminder that Professor Mishra also uh, was the founding director of SOFL at IGNU. And he contributed immensely to, you know, starting the center, the entire school, until he, of course, moved on to JNU in 2014. So he's also a scholar on distance <laughs> learning. <laughs> and, oh, Darshini. So, well, I guess you'll have a good time learning lots of things from him. And I shall take leave now. I'll leave the stage to Professor Mishra. Uh, please go ahead. Sir, most welcome. Stages. Thank you, Dr. Dipanwita, for kind words. <coughs> so, coming straight to the topic, I think we are going to deal with phonetics uh, initially. Okay. Uh, some of you would have already studied the material uh, provided. Uh, so, that is very important, no doubt about it. We must understand the basic notions on phonetics and phonology. Uh, of course, you would have studied, you understand the difference between phonetics and phonology, that phonetics is the scientific study of sounds used 
in language. So that means used by human beings when we create language. And phonology is a language specific study of those sounds. Phonetics studies it scientifically, its description, etc. And in phonology, we try to understand how sounds are used in a particular language. You know that every language does not use all the sounds. So that makes part of phonology of a particular language. Many times, loosely, we say phonetics of French or French phonetics. But when we say this, what we mean actually is phonology of French. And each language uses certain sounds from all the sounds that are used in all the languages of the world. In French, we use about 36 sounds. There are some consonants, there are some vowels. We will use them, we try to understand them, how to use them in French. You speak any language, that language will have its own way of using sound. So this is a very important distinction at the outset, we must understand what is phonetics and what is phonology. Phonology is language related usage of sound. This distinction we must always keep in mind. We have to understand the exact description, physical description of the production of sound, definitely. But we also have to understand how the language is used the how the language uses those sounds a particular language for example how do you pronounce b when i say b and p now these two are the pairs normally we say consonant we will look at the definition of consonant also in a, in few minutes but when we understand the two sounds, b and p, we make a distinction between the two. Many times while talking over phone or while we are uh, talking over uh, any uh, internet-based uh, communication systems, we get confused between the two, these two sounds also. Yet we get the meaning. So the scientific description of these two sounds, b and p, come into the realm of phonetics. And there will be a clear distinction between b and p, which will be symbolically presented also by an internationally accepted system of symbols. That is called IPA, International Phonetic Chart. Its version that we need to understand is you can see any dictionary. When you use any dictionary, you will find a set of symbols which represent certain sounds. <coughs> so how do we distinguish between, let's say, b and pa, or the other example, ka and ga? How do we make the distinction? The scientific distinction will be B and P, they are pronounced both by using the two lips, so bilabial sounds. Almost all the efforts are the same, but we have one feature which distinguishes the two sounds. That feature is called the pertinent feature. Again, a technical term, pertinent feature. What is that feature? Often I ask, people to do an experiment. You pronounce both the sounds. Keep these two fingers in your ear. And then pronounce B and P. Okay. And you will find a difference in the resonance that you hear. Normally, when you pronounce the sound B, as is used in baby, then you will hear a higher resonance. In pa, as used in pantalon, the resonance is lower. 
so we make a distinction on the basis of the resonance where is the resonance coming from from the vocal cords that we have and it gets reflected through our ear drums so if we make the distinction here then b will be called a voiced sound voze in french we have two words for voiced voze and also the other word is sonor there is a sonority there is a greater sonority in the sound <coughs> when we pronounce pa the sonority is there but it is less hence it is called no voice non voiced in english and the other term used in french is sourd sourd as is used for deaf so the consonant so okay in english we don't call it deaf consonant in english we call it non voiced consonant but in french both these terms are used traditionally they use the term sonor a sourd sonor s o n o r e sonor and sourd s o u r d as you know the word for deaf so and consonant is uh, a feminine so so now we have to understand here that we have a list of sounds which are considered to be non voiced and a list of sounds which are voiced if you look at the indian system of writing letters often it becomes very easy to distinguish between the ten, the two i presume that most of you know at least one indian language and if you look at this uh, how you uh, arrange alphabet in indian uh, languages so you see you have a list of five columns so ka is in the beginning ka ka ga ga so you go down the second row will begin cha 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 ja ja so how do you, as you go ka cha ta ta pa these are the five that you will find in the series when you write that the first letter of the list is non voiced and the third one will be its counterpart voiced letter as for example i gave an example of ka and ga pa and ba look at the position ka kha ga ka is in the first position ga is in the third position pa pha ba pa is in the first position ba is in the third position so all that exists on the third position in the indian alphabet system this consonant uh, arrangement they are voiced sounds and those sounds are used in french so it is very easy to remember otherwise you can always do the experiment which i have given you there are two ways one is this and some people hold here also if you hold the here and then pronounce you will immediately feel that in b or g there is a greater resonance all that comes on the third position and its counterpart all the other efforts will be exactly the same if you look at the same line ka kha ga gha so ka and ga all efforts are the same but the only distinction is between voiced and non voiced so no is so so this way you can always identify the sounds that are being used now what we are studying here is actually how the minimal sound unit is being used in a language because what we do in a language we use a sequence of sounds so this is a minimal sound unit that i say ka now when i said ka as i said earlier it is consonant so you know that a consonant cannot be pronounced without a vowel so we have two types 
one consonant and one vowel. Vowel are is a sound. Vowels are those sounds which are pronounced without stopping the air stream. A, a, e, e, u, a, a, whatever. So you don't stop the air stream anywhere. It starts from here, from our lungs, and without stopping, without being stopped by any of our speech organs, it passes through our lips. Then it becomes a vowel. There will be two types of vowels. <coughs> Very basic. One is a, a, e, e, u, u, as we have said. But when you pronounce a vowel, many times you allow the air to pass through your nose also. So they are nasal vowels. And in French, you know, there are lots of nasal vowels. So this distinction will be there, only oral sounds and nasal sounds. The nasal sounds will allow the air to pass through oral cavity as well as allowing some of it, some of the air stream to pass through our nasal cavity. Normally, we don't pronounce any vowel only through nasal cavity. We have sounds. In language, we do have sounds. For example, mm, Mm. Now, we are allowing only nasal sound in this condition, okay? And then you can always have a debate whether it is a vowel or a consonant. Normally, it is considered a consonant. Normally, it is considered a consonant because our uh, lips are closed and they don't allow the air stream to pass. Similarly, if vowels are of two types and we know that a consonant is to be pronounced along with the vowel. So naturally, a consonant will also have either nasal vowel or a completely oral vowel attached to it. And this we have in every language. In French, we, we use a lot of them. So what are we doing here? We are trying to identify the minimal sound units. Now, this is a technical term again. What is a minimal sound unit? That is called phoneme. P-H-O-N-E-M-E, -E, phoneme. Phoneme is the minimal sound unit used in a language. Okay. It's the minimal unit of sound in human language. And all the basic sounds that we use, they are called phonemes. Then we understand phonemes on the basis of the efforts that we make to pronounce them. The places and the manners of articulation. The places, as I said, for example, P will be pronounced by two lips, by joining two lips. So it will be called a bilabial sound, places. Manner of articulation, we just uh, discussed voiced and non-voiced. So that will be part of the manner of articulation. We articulate any sound, any phoneme in a language, and we describe it in order to make a distinction from other sounds in order to understand the pertinent features. You can make a distinction between pa and ka also, but it will not be on the basis of pertinent features because there will be more than one factor which distinguishes between the two. So there will be normally no confusion. There will be scientific description, no doubt about it, but the scientific description will not have the minimal pertinent features because of which we may get confused and sometimes in a language we may find it difficult to pronounce that also. So for that, whenever in any language we tend to understand the sound systems, which means 
the systems of using a phoneme, we always try to identify the pertinent features. First, the description of the sound, and then the pertinent features of the sound. Okay? So any sound we cannot pronounce without a vowel adding to it, and that sound becomes a consonant. The word consonant itself means that. You know the word con, which means with. Still, it is used in Spanish. Uh, and sonne, sonne is used in English also, uh, in French also. Sonne to sound, something that creates a sound. Like a very famous song, sonne le matine, very famous song. So, sound. So, sound which is produced, sonno, sounding with something else. Now, that something else, it is uh, almost like our gerundif, not exactly, but almost part, participle formation from sonne. So, consonant is that sound which is produced with other sound. Then we have ma, pa, ba. We discussed until now pa and ba. We bring ma now. What happens with ma? Pa and ba, we have made a distinction. Pa and ba, we have made a distinction. A very clear distinction is that pa is non-voiced, that is suhd, and ba, ba as used in bebe, or in English you say boy. So this ba sound is voiced. Now you look at ma. Again, both lips are being used, but there is a nasalization. There is a nasal sound. As a rule, all nasal sounds and all vowels are voiced sounds, are sonore. Many times these questions are asked in exam. So as a rule, you remember that all nasal sounds and all vowels are voiced sounds, are sonor. They are all phonemes. So they may ask you also that the nasal phonemes are oral sounds or nasal sounds. Of course, it is nasal. So it is a nasal sound. Then second category, whether they are voiced or non-voiced, whether they're sonor or sooth, the answer is always sonor or voiced. All nasal sounds. You will have nasal sounds. If you look at the Hindi or Indian alphabet system, most of the times used in various languages, you see the first and third I had given you. Look at the last position. <coughs> the fifth position. They are all nasal sounds. Pa, pa, ba, first and third, pa, ba, pa, pa, ba, ba, ma, ma, the last one. Fifth position is always given to the nasal sound. And these nasal sounds are necessarily voiced sounds. So we must understand, we must remember that all vowels are necessarily voiced sounds. And all nasal sounds are necessarily voiced sounds. This distinction we should always remember. This has various implications also. When you study, let's say, a poem, you will find it that in what way they are using the sounds to create the rhyme. It helps there. It helps us to understand that. Not only that, when you go to teach in a classroom, there are many students who pronounce certain sounds in such a manner that you want to correct them. You want to improvise upon them. So try to identify these features. First, identify the phonemes which are being pronounced. And then try to identify whether it is properly being voiced or not, whether it is properly being nasalized or not. Many times the, the issue comes because of our lack of understanding of the place and manner of articulation because it is a foreign language. You know, a very famous sound, U. Most of the Indians 
fail to pronounce it because this sound does not exist in our language. What we fail to do, we don't have a vowel which uses lips in such a manner. We use lips differently. Either we completely round it U or we use E. This is a sound which uses U. No, see effort for every vowel, the air stream comes from here. For every sound air stream comes from lungs, from here, from the end of the throat. It begins from there. Then we articulate it, we modify it by using our speech organs. Now, how we speak, how we modify our speech organs, there is a language tradition to it. Every language has its own tradition. You can hear in India itself, it's di different pronunciations of ch, ch or ch. You go to towards Assam side, they say almost sa, sa, charge, and charge and charge. In French, it happens the sound th. Th is often pronounced in many dialects of French, in many varieties of French, almost a ch, almost a ch. So you identify where the issue comes exactly in terms of place and manner of articulation. In your material, you will find a graph also, a picture of mouth cavity and all the places which are mentioned there and the manners related. You identify them and try to understand how we pronounce and where is the issue. Sh and S, many of us confuse it. Sh and S. And in French, it is very important. Now, again, you see the pertinent feature is very important. In some phonology of Indian languages, sh and s are not pertinently, are not pertinent sounds. Whether you use the sound s or sh, we will understand. Many times it happens. But in French, it is a very important pertinent distinction. In French, we cannot say, as a foreign language speaker, santé for chanter. You know the distinction. Santé would completely signify something different. Chanté would have a completely different meaning. And as foreign language speakers, we have to understand. But our students, our learners make these mistakes because of the sound system that they have learned. In their mind, it is not a pertinent feature. There are many language speakers in your class who make this, uh, this kind of mistake. The mistake is not because they cannot pronounce it. The mistake happens because in their mind, these distinctions of place and manner of articulation are not recorded as pertinent features in the sound. So we have to identify what is the pertinent feature try to understand their sound system and then correct accordingly. Then you can explain them. Uh, once you make your explanations, you try to understand and create a strategy also. There are some well known strategy also in this context, but every time you may have to think of how to explain a particular phonemic sound. See, phoneme is the minimal sound. So identify the minimal sound where the student is making a problem. Or if there is a problem in the speech itself, where is the problem? Which organ of creation of sound is not being used properly? Identify that and then you can accordingly decide your strategy. There are many languages which do not have certain clusters of sounds. As for example, I can give you an example here. In Indian languages, any of language that you speak, you try to identify generally a cluster sound like ps does not exist that you find in French psychology, English also psychology. In English, English also, there are very few sounds like this. So, 
but in French we use it. And consequently what happens due to interference of English and since we do not have this sound so frequently used in Indian languages, our students would find it difficult to pronounce psychology correctly. So we identified that, okay, not only phonemes, but cluster of phonemes, which phoneme is used in which context. Okay. That we have to understand. Which phonemes are used together? And each language has its own set of accepted combinations of phonemes and not so easily accepted com combinations of phonemes. On this basis, many times we hear a sound and we say, we hear a word and we say that, look, this doesn't sound French. And on what basis do we say? It might be used in French as a loan word. It might have come from some other language. Yet, when we interact with it for the first time, we say it doesn't sound French. The basic distinction in our mind that we have, that French phonology does not use these kinds of sounds. As for example, I have said so in psychology, there will be many words, but look at the word Pepsi. It's a drink. In French, you will not find similar other examples where so is being used in second or third position. Initial position it is being used, but in second or third position, this cluster is not being used. So Pepsi, our Indian speakers have started speaking, that helps us as a strategy that, okay, Pepsi, remove P and C, just keep C. This is what we, we use when we pronounce psychology. But if you hear a sound, a word, or hear a, if you hear a sequence of sound where C is being used in second or third position, then you will immediately feel that, okay, it doesn't sound French. So we have many such similar features in every language. And in French also you can identify such features where syllabic features can be easily identified. <clears throat> and in order to understand this, and in order to understand the notations of this, we use the symbolic alphabet that are used in often in dictionaries. That's the easiest way. Otherwise, there are international phonetic charts also, which is given in your material also. But that may be slightly difficult for our purpose. It is the easiest way that you take a dictionary and you can immediately identify all the sounds, all the symbols which are used for representation of sounds. So until now, am I clear or if there is any question or if any confusion, kindly tell me. What we have tried to understand is that the distinction between phonetics and phonology Definition of phoneme, what is a phoneme, what is a consonant, and the basic understanding of international phonetic association chart, which are often used in dictionaries. Any standard dictionary you will find, they use it on internet, La Russe, or anywhere you find, you just have to try to find out the phonetic transcription of a word. So you try to identify the phonetic transcription of a word. Is that fine until now? Is any confusion? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Otherwise, if you have any problems, you just stop me. So in French, what happens? Sir, there sir. are somebody you want to say something? Yes sir. Yes. yes, sir. My yes, sir. Sir, one question. Then what is phonics? Uh, what, what is, is phonics? phonics? No, phonics is not a used, uh, is a word used in uh, phonetics and phonology at this stage. Phonics, E H O N E C N I C S. Yeah, yeah. What e is that? 
No, that, that is a completely different word. Phonics is not a word that comes directly from linguistics. It is used mostly in music and such other fields. So we, we don't have for, for phoneme, phonic can be there sometimes, P-H-O-N-I-C. Yes. So, but phonic simply means a sound. Phone means sound. Yes. Okay. Phone means sound. And from there you get the adjective phonic. That's all. Nothing more than that. And that is normally not used in linguistics. So you will not encounter this word generally. Phoneme, P-H-O-N-E-M-E -E, is a technical term. So that you must uh, remember. Okay. Phoneme you must remember. And that's all. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, phonics is not uh, in our field, not really relevant for our field. It is used as a general common word in some other fields when you talk of music, etc., etc. Okay, is that fine? Yes. yes. So now, yes, generally, thank you. So now we, we say that we have 17 consonants in French, generally. 17 consonants in French. Okay, and there are three semi vowels or semi consonants in French. You can find the list very clearly anywhere. 17 consonants, very simple pa, ta, ka, pa, da, ga, fa. Ba. I will I will give you words also with this. For example, pa, as is used in palm or coupe, coupe, ta, like in toi, site, site internet, ta. Then ka, for example, kant or kayak, ba, bu. Ba, en ba, ba, ba. Similarly, you go on the list as de, like in dance. De ma, ma, de. Then we have gamin, ga, gamin, gamin. We have sound fa, fa, like fa, femme, femina. So here you have the consonant fa, vrai, devoir. So, v as a sound. Passé, se, consonne. Poison, z. Maison, z. Then we have cheval, sh or vache, sh. Z is also a sound like je m'appelle, j. Or bazar is the same sound, z. Then l, lune, bal, ri. You ri, r as a sound. Amour, r as a sound. Then we have ma, moto, na, nasal, consonne, na, nui, and nia, ligne, anio. Many such words. Nia. So these are 17 consonants. 17 consonantal phonemes used in French, in a standard French. Okay? They are represented in various ways that we will see, we will discuss. For example, the written system in phonetics and phonology, we understand that how you write is not important. Here we are discussing the way speech exists in French language. For example, quand and kayak. So in quand, what we letter represents the sound? Say. And in kayak, it is ka, ka, ka. So it can be represented in different ways. Sometimes q, u, a is used to represent ka. So sound is the same, ka. So for us, it is the same phoneme represented in various ways in writing systems. And in French, we have to understand this relationship between the writing system and the phonemes. You identify the phonemes first, 
and look at the corresponding writing notations of it. Then you can easily identify a system in French which helps you also pronounce the words because in French the representation of sounds through alphabetical uh, alphabetical groups they have a, almost a very systematic rule that is not found in english in english it is very absurd in comparison to french in fact there is no language which completely can be written as it is pronounced but at least in french the sounds are represented by and large in such a way in written system that we can identify the correspondence with a greater regular feature. Then we have three uh, semi-vowels as for example, year, year, or the same year is found in like B, B, A. So, what are the two representations? E L L E, E the same or Y, E G R I K E U, many times. <coughs> These two represent the same sound. The phonetic, phonologically, sound is the same. It's the same phoneme written in two different ways. So that is why there would be various other orthographical representations, but number of cis of phonemes in a language by and large is very uh, regulated and fixed that is a feature of language that with a minimal number of phonemes we can create unlimited number of sounds with a very limited number of sounds in a language we can create unlimited number of messages this is a feature in human language. This is called the principle of double articulation. When we articulate, we have two articulations. One is the meaning. We have very limited number. 17 consonants, three semi-vowels in French. And how many vowels do we have in French? 12. Now you see. With 17, you can find the list. If you want, I can uh, tell you the list like E, A, 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 like Ami, E, Ale, A, A, T, A, Vre, the Vre, A, A, like in table, Ohal, then we have Pa, like Pat, O, like in Mor, or Chronology, then we have similar O like in bato, o, then u, like tu, tut, hu, so many such words. Then u, tu, mue, sue, u. And then we have another uh, tenth vowel is e, uh, like in jeun, jeun. And then we have schwa, that is called u, uh, uh, like je, le, l. Okay? Like je m'appelle, so, so this e, uh, je, je m'appelle e, uh, it's element, and we have another twelfth vowel is bur, of, enough. Okay, bur. So these are twelve vowels. With twelve vowels, three semi vowels, and seventeen consonants, we can create unlimited number of messages in French with a very limited number of sounds with a very limited number of phonemes we can create unlimited number of messages this is a very important feature in language okay now here at this stage I have explained you the that each phoneme will have a corresponding symbol which is internationally accepted which you find in the dictionaries now try to identify those systems and 
try to write words and sentences using that phonemic script as given in dictionaries. Dictionary is the best. Otherwise, there are other systems. Uh, there are many other books also which explain. But dictionary is any standard dictionary like Pati Robert or Lagos. Pati Robert is the best. You can always use Pati Robert and see how it is being pronounced and see how it is being transcribed phonetically. This is a practice that you must undertake. Take a few words, write a sentence as for example, je veux manger du riz. Je veux manger du riz. Take each word, je veux manger du riz and try to write it the way it is given in the dictionary. Then also in the next phase, you can try something. For example, je veux manger du riz. You will see that many times when we pronounce, when we speak in the language, the sound of words is different when we say only one word. And when we say a full sentence, then some of the sounds are not used. As for example, I have just now said je m'appelle. Now, if you see je, it will have two sounds. But in a sentence like je m'appelle, you will see that je and me, they come together without any vowel in between. Many times you, you hear carefully. You will find such distinctions happening in the spoken language. So when you it is a written language, it's all right. You can make a distinction. Try to identify such differences also between the written way of transcribing the language and how it is being transcribed in a, a spoken form. A spoken form will always have less number of phonemes because we always try to minimize our efforts when we speak a language. And this you will find when children speak, they also do it. This is one very important feature which distinguishes between the language of uh, children and adults and also often language of men and women. You will find distinctions on these X's. You can always find what are the distinctions on these issues. Many studies have been undertaken on these, but I will not go into those studies. They're not very pertinent, but as a as an exercise, you can do it. You just pay attention to this, how men speak, how women speak, how adults speak, how uh, children speak, and how uh, youngsters of the age of 15, 16, 14, they speak. There is also a gender distinction at that age also. And you just pay attention to that. You will enjoy. That's all. And by while enjoying this, you will be practicing your phonemic understanding also whatever we have tried to understand. So I mean, this will help you memorize also many things just as a game. So it is just a game. You, you will enjoy do, doing these things. So it's all right. Anything else? If not, then I will try to give you some important uh, uh, correspondence between orthographical representations of the sounds as happens in French. Some of it, some of it. Uh, one or two I have already talked, like I E L L E, E does L E. This is mostly E. Mostly there, there, there are exceptions. You remember the some of the exceptions? Wheel, meal. This is an exception. E L L E is mostly E, and by practice you know it already. You just have to pay attention on these facts that whenever does S comes. Between, uh, between two uh, vowels, it is pronounced as sir, and if it is one S, it is pronounced as the. Then there are some exceptions you will find. For example, you know the distinction between dozium and salon. When there are only two things, and you have to say the second one, you say salon. Now look at this word salon. And, and, and deuxième we use like premier, premier garçon, deuxième garçon, troisième garçon, quatrième garçon, we can say. But if there are only two, then, then we'll say la seconde garçon. 
<coughs> now look at this the way this sound sound is being pronounced normally the sound the, the written letter say never represents g but here what happens here so, the word is sound but you find two features here normally we know that in french the last consonant or the last cluster of consonant is not pronounced some exceptions are c f l r that also not always but generally you know at, at your stage you know these rules so what happens here in, when i say sound and you can check it in the dictionaries there is no a at the end de is the last consonant and there is a cluster of consonant o n d so n d is a cluster of consonant yet the is being pronounced so identify such uh, such uh, uh, exceptions also and the other exception very important exception here is that we don't say k we say g sagon why g now see what happens here we have studied the distinction between k and g what is the distinction g is voiced k is non voiced so in a flow in a language many times voiced sounds change to non voiced and many times non voiced sound change to voiced sounds this kind of change keeps happening in a language even in a standard language and when we speak then also we make these uh, changes our listener understands because they know the word even if i say sakon you will understand but there is a standard with because it is a foreign language so there is a, a standard pronunciation try to identify that standard pronunciation on the basis of such features is it okay anything else then similarly you can identify several consonant clusters which are pronounced in a particular way like e a uh, dazel a uh, i have given you one there are many o e like in ma twa wa fa fa poisson falwa now you see o e it is pronounced in a typical way you will not find this pronunciation in any indian language generally even in english you will find very less in english we don't pronounce it this way many times i notice it in indian english when we say for example boy relatively a standard pronunciation is boy but in many uh, regional uh, accents of pronouncing english in india i hear boy so it is almost like falwar boy boy they, they will not say boy they will say boy it is a regional accent many regional accents have this you can identify such regional accents even in french what makes the distinction between the standard french and other accents in french for example in south of france you listen to it differently what they make at what point do they make the distinction the distinction of length of vowel number 1 and number 2 the way you pronounce the uh, consonant clusters for example no indian languages we don't have half pa and no in the beginning almost not acceptable but in standard french it is there no and you go to south of france they will say pa no oh, south of france in marseille and the nearby region they very comfortably say pa no because they are not habituated to removing the vowel between these two phonemes pa and no this is what makes the distinction between two different ways of pronouncing the same language what we often call in linguistics two different dialectal variations you find in hindi also or any indian language you can identify immediately that this person belongs to most probably to this region on the basis of these two features how do they pronounce the consonant clusters and what is the length of the vowel For, for example hindi as spoken in eastern parts like bihar 
and uh, parts of eastern UP, vowel lengths are longer. You, you go to Delhi and Haryana region, vowel lengths will be relatively shorter. But there also there are many other features. Similarly in French also. Any language you can identify that. So similarly try to identify which uh, uh, group of alphabet represents what phoneme. Identify all the phonemes and related spellings. Like a, a, u will always be o, walo, o. <coughs> so you can easily identify in French. And if you identify this <coughs> relationship between orthography and its phonemic uh, value, you can easily master even the French system of writing. Is it okay? Any questions that you have until now? You can identify the places where CH can be pronounced as SH or as K, like architect. But you will have many such places where CH, say ASH, will be pronounced as K. And it is there in every language. So, what we have discussed until now is what is a phoneme? What is a sound? What is the notion of uh, symbolic representation of sound in terms of International Phonetic Association chart? And what is a consonant? We have learned that there are 17 consonants in, in, in French, three semi-vowels in French, and 12 vowels in French. And here I always mean the standard French. There will be variations also, because you know, uh, how do we distinguish between the African French and the standard French uh, of uh, a particular region of France? on the basis of some of the factors that we discussed, that how do they pronounce the consonant clusters, how the manners of articulation differ, and the length of the ball. Then we have also discussed that we should try to write the words through their symbolic representations and also using those words in a sentence and hearing the speech because the speech is primary for us. So this is another aspect that we have learned. Then we have learned the relationship between orthography in French and its phon phonemic value. We have also studied what is a vowel and what is a semi-vowel. So these are the basic issues that we have discussed until now. We have understood the difference between phonetics and phonology also. So is that fine? Anything else? Anything that you have uh, to ask me from phonology? Because if not, then we will switch over now to the, our next topic, morphology. So at this stage, if you have any questions, if you have any doubts, you can ask it later also at the end of the session, but since now we will switch over to another discussion topic, it will be morphology. So, before, uh, yes. Sir, do we have to remember these vowel sounds and these consonants? You, no, will, you will automatically remember them. Okay. You just go to the dictionaries. It is not difficult at all. Okay. Because you see, how many sounds are there in a language? You know all of them. You automatically remember. Okay. I have given you one easy system to remember on the basis of the uh, Indian language systems that we use. However, the only problem is the alphabet. And that's why, you know, in, when we teach French, normally we don't teach alphabet in the beginning. 
because we concentrate on the sounds and the alphabetical system like abecede etc they are not at least the roman based alphabetical system that we use in french they are not representative of sounds in the language in indian languages it is often representative often not completely so it is not very difficult you just keep Uh, flipping through your dictionaries many times, and you can automatically grasp it. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's not easy. <clears throat> many times they can ask you that how many vowels are there in French, how many uh, consonants are there in French, how many semi vowels are there in French. That you should know anyway, and you can easily identify them. Not very difficult. In many dictionaries, you can find. Just go through many of the prefaces of good dictionaries; you will find it there also. <coughs> okay. Anything else? Okay. Try to do some exercises where you take the see pay, simply pay, or ka, and look at the description in the dictionary. Even dictionaries explain it very clearly. Good dictionary like Pati Robert, and see the terms that I am trying to use here. They will explain it to you in that manner, both in French as well as in English. In English, Oxford Dictionary, Cambridge Dictionary, good ones they will explain. And in French, Pati Robert is very easily available. Take a standard version of Pati Robert and try to identify the descriptions of each of these sounds. You will identify them. Is it fine? So now we take the next topic that we have, that is morphology. Sir, I have a question. May I ask? Yes, please, please. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, uh, uh, I was. Uh, I wanted to know that uh, the. Status of H uh, in French, H is often silent. Ash uh, muye. Uh, does it often? Uh, is it a semi-vowel like it? Uh, when it is silent, is it like a vowel? What is a vowel? See what I told you that. Pay attention to speech, not the way it is represented. its orthographical representation i discussed but pay attention to speech in speech h is neither a vowel nor a consonant it is just a letter in the alphabetical system vowels are con and consonants are found in the speech so what is a vowel when we allow the air stream to pass without any stoppage that is a vowel so the way a particular word is being pronounced for example onet now onet o you identify it it is a vowel so it has nothing to do with h h is the orthographical representation of it so h in itself or be say they in itself they are neither vowels nor consonants you pay attention to the sounds that are being used in a speech there you can identify if you say h is a consonant what does it mean do you mean the sound ch the the sound ch can be represented by various orthographies in french we can describe ch but we cannot describe phonetically alphabetical clusters like say ash or te say ash we cannot it's not possible because they are not phonemic sounds so pay attention to the sounds that it is not the alphabet that we are discussing is it okay niranjan ji Uh, yes, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, in case of English, for example, in English, in hospital, H is pronounced, or say no, it, no, H no. is not pronounced. Look at it differently. Okay. What has happened? You have a word like hospital. 
and even if there is an illiterate person who doesn't know to read and write the person will use the word hospital if he or she happens to be an english speaker so primary is a speech so now you have hospital which can be written with the sound h look at it this way is it okay niranjan ji i'm just asking you to look at the other way the word hospital or the sound ha in hospital exists in language as a sound which can be represented by certain notations which can be h in yes, a particular space yeah, yeah. Okay. i understand okay so you pay attention to the description of the sound ha now whether ha is a vowel or is a consonant i will say consonant because what is the distinction between a and ha in ha at the end you try here itself you try to block air stream little bit so it is a consonant it is a traditional description where we say this is this letter is sound is silent a letter is never silent or never spoken because we go the other way i have given you example like juma pel now is a silent there it is not silent but that is how we speak we never say it is silent nobody tells you a new way but in phonological description of french it happens so go from a speech to writing system and that is what helps us in understanding the language and the way it is represented in written system also fine any any other confusion or doubt questions we just have to remember always that in language studies or in linguistics which is primary good afternoon sir uh, sir uh, in french uh, this h h on the semi vowel but in case so sometime we don't pronounce it still they hold the status of semi vowel shall no. we ha h see no letter can have semi vowel or consonant etc etc no letter can have otherwise yeah. what will you say immediately that in french in written alphabetical system how many vowels do you have five sec sec right. how many vowels did i tell you just now 12 12 now combination of your two no it is not a combination of vowel at all because a a u this is how you represent but a a u is one vowel it is one sound these are not three sounds this is not even when you say uh, when i said walo or o o can you say that these are three sounds and combination of three sounds or it is one sound walo or kisko se kisko o o that you drink water that you drink o o o okay or that we use in shato walo toho now look at this you represent it with three letters but sound is one and these three sounds if you go by this definition that you have only five alphabet in the written system then there are three vowels but sound is only one so we cannot go by that distinction that is why our numbers change i told you 17 plus 3 plus 12 to count it totally how many sounds but alphabet 26 only so please let us not confuse this with the written system that's why i said in orthographical representation it is something different but identify the sound like o oh, there is only one sound it is not three sounds which is represented by a combination of three letters a a u and many times 
like e dazel a now these are four letters in which la is not a vowel but two non vowel letters dazel when they come between e and a so so the vowel so e so dazel represents the sound ya almost so that is why please try to understand this that this traditional definition does not work in understanding the issues in language of five vowels this does not help us that's why i have given you a different list and you can identify this list this kind of list in any the standard dictionaries in pakito bar you see you will find it right in the beginning preface and all that they will give you the notations and this is one sound which may be represented in different ways is it okay you, uh, you try to identify coccinel accident try to identify these how many sounds are there so they ask you how many phonemes are there in accident so a p s i d o that's all you can immediately count a k s i d o so only five phonemes are there which are represented by how many letters a c c e d o n t see eight letters and then you can identify that o n these are two letters which mean o and the last t last consonant in french in written french is mostly silent in spoken french now this is the relationship that i am trying to make that you can make between the orthographical representation and the sounds like a and t represents only sound o three letters but one vowel nasalized vowel o that's all is it fine any confusion at this point you can ask me <coughs> thank you okay thank you so now let us go to morphology which is our next topic morphology just as phonemes we discuss phonemes so i start from there without introducing you to morphology let me start with the concept called phonemes and its equivalent concept morpheme you know phoneme now phoneme is the minimal sound unit used in a language morpheme is similarly the minimal meaningful unit used in a language l'unité minimal the sens l'unité minimal the son sound phoneme l'unité minimal the sens the minimal meaningful unit in the language is called morpheme so we understand what is a morpheme now in a language in any language we have several morphemes which are either bound or free they may exist independently and they may be bound in the language they may be bound for example when you you use uh, like uh, in french you have many uh, morphemes uh, like ha ra ra ah a is many times used before words je vais manger je vais ha manger i am going to eat again now okay ra voir so ra is repeatedly being used in the sense of doing the same action again so we can identify that ra is a morpheme in french 
because it has a particular meaning and it does not exist independently so it is always bound with some word and it is always bound in the beginning of the word so a kind of prefix in traditional terminology so prefix suffix sometimes infix also happens so these kinds of changes and their meaning value they help us identify the morphemes and a study of how these minimal meaningful units whether free or bound are used in a language is called morphology so morphology is a discipline of language studies in which we study the processes of formation of words how words are formed in a language there are many processes i have given you some on the basis of morphemes there are some new words taken from a loan word they become french word they were originally not french words they become french words in every language it happens the words come from abroad from other languages or the words assume different and new meanings due to change in realities think of uh, let's say 50 years ago we may not have understood what we understand today by the word mouse some 20 30 years ago we won't have understood it now you see so many many of you uh, send thumbs so these are emojis etc they all keep evolving and that is all part of our language and we keep evolving such symbolic representations of meaning that we intend to convey so words come along with words its representations come in various ways a systematic study of that in relation to the meaning that we convey in relation to the words that we create in a language is called morphology how new words are coined how old words change their forms and there are different types of derivations also that happens we do in french for example from noun to adjective from noun to verb there are many such telephone telephone now telephone becomes a verb and telephone or telephone la telephone it is a noun so what we have understood is that we add a ah at the end and it becomes a morpheme see ah a ah in the beginning was a morpheme similarly a ah, ah at the end when we add it it will be considered a morpheme if you want to make a new verb which can be from any word any noun for which verb does not exist until date you what will you do you will add a ah at the end and we do make such plays also for example many times i have heard uh, my first year students the basic learners you ask them to use even english words so that they speak in french okay and let them use the english word so what they do okay crosser la rue crosser la street now it is just one week and the student doesn't know what is the word for to cross the street so cross they will use crosser they keep evolving what has a stuck in the mind they have learned the first group word a uh, a uh. so they will add a uh, a uh. so this is from the morphemic understanding of the language you will hear many many such uh, plays in language you will find <clears throat> and we keep evolving also like earlier some uh, 30 40 years ago you will not hear in english i telephoned him i called him existed 
but now I hear, I telephoned him. And now, very recently, I have started hearing also I mobile him. I called him on mobile and I have heard some youngsters saying I mobile him. Like I messaged him. See, message to send a message. Message was never a word. To message someone. It was not used mostly as a verb in this sense, but I messaged him today. I have already messaged him. You will not hear, you will not read such sentences some 30, 40 years ago. I have sent a message. The messenger, all these words existed. But we have evolved on the basis of the morphemic understanding. In English, ED, when it is added at the end, it means past tense. So similarly, we try to identify in every language the minimal units. Like for example, in French, one of the first thing that we do is the first group, second group, third group ones. On what basis we do identify? A active morphemes. A ach, e ach, and ach, a. <coughs> Then we will try to identify other factors. For example, if you have to take, let's say, indicative French, basic, indicative um, and present tense in French. For example, let's say the verb, verb like parler. What we do? A, A is a morphine. We take it out. Then we add what do we add? We add only three things. I told you, pay attention to the speech. Then go for its written part. Yes, written part is important. But first pay attention to speech, then to the written part. What happens? We remove a act, which is, which is the sound a, parler. What we have removed is the sound a. And what we have added? Sound a, on and a. Only three sounds. Nothing more. It will have multiple written representations, which comes from a historical background. But what is a morpheme here? Morpheme is a, on, and a, only three. We will not say that morpheme is a, and the, and a, s, and a. No, we, we, that we will not say. In the morphemic representation, it is the, again a speech that matters. So our in our speech, there is only a morpheme, which has four functions. Je parle, tu parle, il parle, and il parle au pluriel. You know that. So this sound a represents the meaningfulness of the sentence, uh, meaningfulness of the word in a particular sentence. And by that, you immediately identify. Then, by the context, you understand the meaning. So, there are three morphemes here very clearly identifiable. And by these three morphemes, what you have identified? That in indicative French, if it is je parle, je parle, then we identify it is indicative French, indicative present tense, present time. Suppose I say j'ai parlé. Now, parlé, it is a which is replaced by a. Both is the same. We have not done any change. But what, where we have added a, je has become a. So you identify the morpheme there. And by identification of this morpheme, you will understand the language and its meaning. So in this manner, you can identify several time structures. For example, je parle, I said. And je parlais. Now, je parlais, je parlais, je parlerai. These are all different structures. And these are called morphemic structures on the basis of which you identify passé composé, imparfait. So, imparfait, A. Je parlais, tu parlais, il parlait, il, elle parlait. Again, only one. And yon and ye. So, only three. Similarly, you add je parlerai. So, a, r, or, 
and A. These are two morphemes. A morpheme is used in various places and when Pahla, we add A morpheme, then it can have various functions like in passé composé, like in, uh, in imparfait, but if the morpheme A is preceded, this is infixation of morpheme, or par la ré, this infixation of morpheme, par la A and in between or is added, then we have conditional. So par la ré will have three morphemes. You can identify them accordingly. So any word formation process, it requires an understanding of morphemes and morphemic uh, usages and morphemic combinations in a language. We can we identify the meaning in a language on the basis of our understanding of morphemic combinations in a language. Some morphemes are bound and some are free. What do you mean by free? For example, if I say a word like uh, present or present, you see that there is nothing like a present. You cannot uh, identify any structure like pre or sans, any, anything like that. You cannot identify. So it is one morpheme and it exists independently. Like temps, time, I say time. If I say re-time, I'm, I'm going to run again, please re-time me. Now see, here re has a different function, but time remains as it is. This is called a free morpheme. Morpheme which exists independently in the language. Each word is a morpheme which may have completely a free morpheme or may be constituted of a free and a bound morpheme or morphemes. Time is a morpheme, free morpheme. Retime is a word which has two morphemes. Then you, by identification, for example, you have a word like bon. So bon, it can be plural, it can be singular. Then how do you identify between plural and singular? In a speech, we don't identify. Hence, what we call, it is a plural marking morpheme, but zero morpheme. In writing, it has a representation, S. Bon, singular, and bon, plural. S in writing, we add. But in French, it is always a zero morpheme, which marks the speech, in his, which, which marks plural in his speech. But feminine will be marked. Bon, bon. But bon in singular and plural. Petit, petit. Masculine, feminine is marked very clearly in French. But singular, plural is not morphemically marked in French, generally. Sometimes it is done. For example, enough. What is the plural? There's a. What has happened? For is removed. So a morpheme may be removed also. Enough and a plural of enough is this. So you identify it on the basis of de, the, these two sounds also. So in a speech, what has happened? That this becomes very important. De and the also. In written, if you go by the traditional written explanations, of, of, or of, a. Uh, but in his speech, it will be always used as enough and this. Uh, so the description will have a total speech in which we can identify the morphemes. Many times, uh, let me think of a sentence or if you can help me, where a uh, and the, like il. Where, where the last the 
is used for liaison the last consonant is used for liaison for example ils sont allés ils sont allés sont allés exactly ils sont allés very good example thank you thank you ils sont allés now ils sont venu but ils sont allés now you see ta is used here so ta becomes a morpheme here here you can identify ils sont venu and ils sont allés how do you make a distinction because ta is a morpheme il est allé ta here is used as a morpheme and that becomes again part of the prosody of the language so we have masculine we have gender marking morphemes we have number marking morphemes we have many times adjective and adverb marking morphemes for example religion how do you make adjective religieux so what happens here this system of sound here represented by e a e x is the morpheme here which makes an adjective and its feminine will be there un homme religieux une femme religieuse so see the your and years these are two adjective marking morphemes and then you have adverb marking morpheme like more in french like and you know how to make it religieusement 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 we make feminine adjective and we add more so what we have identified in an adverb from a noun we we have morphemes which first make a feminine adjective and then we have morpheme which makes verb i uh, sorry makes adverb so religion religieux religieuse religieusement so this kind of word formation process of bound and free morphemes of using repetitively the minimal meaningful unit with your years and more you will find it being used repetitively and hence on that basis we identify that more is a minimal meaningful unit which categorizes at making of adverbs independently it doesn't exist if i say m o n t or more it doesn't exist independently if i say more independently it might mean something else in french like m o n t like mountain and other stuff hills all these things will exist but m o n t more it does not exist independently so in this manner we try to identify the various part of the words various aspect of the minimal meaningful unit used in a verb by which we try to create words if we have to make the next verb or we have to create the next adverb what is the strategy verb i gave you example cross a a a we will add it or e a we will add it depending upon our understanding or more we will add this kind of formation of new words or understanding the existing words in various way coining of new words as happens in the language is the science of morphology now here another issue that comes is it fine until now any questions that you have Have one question. Yeah. So, in the example, uh, ils sont venus and ils sont allés. So the morpheme to is added. So does that also mean that one phoneme to is also a phoneme? Can be a morpheme? Oh yes, 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 yes. Why not? One phoneme can also be a morpheme. It depends. It depends. I, I, I just added, for example, a. Yeah. You remove je parle, tu parles, il parle. A, a is one phoneme. Yes. It is one phoneme. and it has four 
morphemic understanding. Okay. Yes. Uh, so can be equal to one morphem. Yes. Yes. Uh, sir, in that case, uh, in uh, aversion, that parlettil, that T, how do you differentiate between that? Yes. <coughs> there also the same happens that when you, in aversion, under what conditions? Question marking morphemes. Okay. So, aversion is one strategy, but parlettil and parlettil, T helps you there further. Uh, sir, one one more thing. When you said uh, parlor ray, so there are three morphemes here, right? Uh, which are the three? Parle, 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 a. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, the difference between uh, future and conditional. It's difficult to explain, I think, so because parlor a, parlor a. In speech, the only distinction will be two different a and a. So parlor a in future is, in the standard French is a parlor a, and in conditional it is je parlerai. Parler. As far as standard French is concerned. But I know that there is a huge problem there. What you say is correct. You understand many times je parlerai and je parlerai in the same way. And you pronounce also many times, not only Indians, but the French themselves do it. The French themselves do it. So maybe they will understand the, uh, the, the meanings attached to conditional where you are being polite or um, uh, you are requesting or something like that. So this politeness is perhaps represented by some other features, like uh, our gestures. It can be by our gestures. It can be by the tones in the language, by the rise and fall in the language, which we cannot cut, which is very difficult to identify. They cannot be segmented. So by these factors, which, factors in the language which are above segmentation, they are called supra-segmental features of language. Many times we do it. Many times we use it in language. We speak in such a manner, with such a tone, that it is a request. And if you try to segment those features, not possible to segment. They are just part of the sound. So this is, this is called supra-segmental feature in the language. <coughs> but anyway, is it fine until now? So, so uh, what I understood was that if it's the future, the AI, that AI in the future is pronounced like E acute, A. And if it's the conditional AIS, then it's pronounced like E grave, A. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So it's a, it's a difference between E acute and E grave sounds, future and conditional. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you, sir. Yes, yes. But that is a standard French. Yes, sir. And the so called standard variety of any language is uh, spoken in a very minuscule population and they also in a very formal atmosphere at home also they may not make a distinction okay sir. in a very because we will not always speak to our children to our wives spouse etc always in a very formal way so and conditional is a very okay, formal sir. speech so that also we have to keep in mind but otherwise your explanation of with the category of e acute accent aigu and accent half is correct. Thank you, sir. Yes, now what we have been discussing is the formation of world. But there is a basic issue. What is a world? We have not discussed it. That's what I told you that I, I start with morphine. Our primary issue is when we study word formation processes in morphology, if that is the definition, the first question is, what is a word? But since we have discussed uh, phoneme uh, in the beginning of the class today, in the beginning of our interaction today, so I came to morpheme because it is a parallel concept. And these two concepts are often put together, phoneme and morpheme. Uh, so I started from there. But now let us come to the question, what is a word? 
Now, what is a word? In French itself, you will find uh, very interesting uh, issues on this. For example, <coughs> pomme and pomme de terre. Now, pomme de terre, is it one word or three words? Okay, there is one response, three. Okay, I, uh, most of you know little, know little bit of Hindi? Little bit at least. I, uh, in, yes, in, in the Hindi speaking area, we have a few words which I will tell you. You know the word gulab, which is rose? Most of you? Yes, sir. Okay, gulab means rose. And there's another word, jamun which is a fruit. So, gulab and jamun, you pronounce them together, gulab, jamun, it is something different. Now, how would you say gulab, jamun, is it one word or two words? One. So, then, uh, Maithili's answer of uh, pom the taf, where does it hold? Now, Sir, pom the be... I said three because it is written as three different words. That is why pom the Gulab Jamun is also written as two different words. That's I'm why not saying it is one word. I, didn't say I have that. always told you, pay attention to speech and meaning. In language, that's what matters. So what is a word? That sequence of sound, which is when pronounced, refers to a meaning for you. Now, if I say on the track, Yes. Uh, for example, we have boîte repas. Yes. So here it is two words or one word? No, here repeat. we consider it as one word, right? Boîte repas. No, please explain that word. I'm not able to understand that word. What is the word? Le boîte repas. Ah, yes, yes. Le boîte repas. Yes. Oui. So the tiffin box. Yes, yes. Le boîte repas. How do you understand it? It is a one word. It is one word. It's a one word so is it that off. when it has a hyphen no, in between? Listen, no, hyphen is all uh, your written strategy. I told okay. you, pay attention to the speech. Sir, one is portemonnaie. Yes, 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 portemonnaie. Also there. Exactly. Now, what are you doing? You have taken free morphemes, put them together with some strategy, which is phonological strategy, put them together, and you refer to one reality. So if I say la boîte hapa, what do you understand? See the definition. That sequence of sounds, which is when pronounced, which when pronounced refers to a meaning for you. So if I say la boîte hapa and all the words that you have given, pom the tag, so many words, what you have done? Boat exists independently. Hapa exists independently. These are two independent free morphemes, morpheme leap. But yes, la peau de vin is also there, but you place them together to refer to something different. It is a third reality. Bwat hapa, it is neither bwat ni hapa. You cannot use it as a bwat and bwat hapa can be without a hapa also. You have not put your lunch, etc. anything there to eat. Still it is bwat hapa. So what we have done, this is what we study. What is a word? Take the basic definition. That sequence of sound, which is when pronounced, refers to a meaning for you. If we don't know French, it will not have any meaning for us. So it is not a word for me. You, you pronounce a Chinese word in front of me, I may not understand. So it is not a word for me. But what hapa, what you pronounce, I understand. Hapa, you pronounce, I understand. You mix the two free morphemes. And what the hapa can be a third word. Now its written representation is a different issue. That depends upon many conventions which evolve automatically in a language. 
Like for example, pot de vin, you find a tiré. Okay, you always put a dash. Yes, silvu play is also one word. Even though silta play, silvu play exists, but you never understand it as if it pleases you. Literally, it means that. But you don't understand this way. Simply, you understand it, please. So for us, it is one word because it refers to one comprehensive meaning for us. And that meaning is again socially and conventionally decided in the same way as its written representation also. Like pom de terre, there is nothing um, which says that it is one word. There are many such experiences. For example, uh, you can see de, pach, and de pach. Now, the pach is a logical connector. So it is one. And the is separate, pach is separate, and the pach also comes together. So you will find many such. So what is a word? This is a very tricky question in a language. I'm trying to simplify it, but there are lots of debates on it. But the simplest way to understand is that sequence of sound, which is when pronounced, creates a meaning for you, brings a meaning to you. And if you do not, if it doesn't uh, bring any meaning to you, then it is not a word for you. It may be a new word in French, which I don't know. So then it's not a word for me. Until and unless I guess that it has a meaning which I don't know. Then I try to know. And once I know it, then it becomes a word for me. Until that point, I, it may not be a word for me because I'm not sure if it means something. And there are words which are loan words which come from other languages. There are words which are made by joining the existing words like pom, the, ta. These are three different realities in the language, three different words, but you put them together, it becomes one word also. So pom the ta. Similarly, you all have given many examples. All those examples are valid. Just think on the debate whether it is what which is important or hapa which is important. And many such words you can identify in every language. So this is the process of formation of word that we study in a language. This is how new realities keep coming. Tomorrow, nowadays I hear that in future, there, there will be printable meat. So you can print like we print our uh, articles, etc. You can print your food. So it, it is a vegetarian meat. Um, I have read articles in newspapers and all that. Now that is a new reality that will come. So how will we make words for that? By what process? If I follow this process, perhaps tomorrow we may have a word like um, <coughs> beyond the imprime. Now, beyond the imprime, something that I have, I have ordered, I go to a restaurant, as they say in many articles, etc., that you can go and order beyond the imprime. So it becomes one word, it becomes one reality for us. How we have made this? Look at the process. Like, many, many, many such words uh, you will find in every language. So this is what we try to understand by morphology. Sir, uh, yes. sir, pardon, pardon, sir. Actually, uh, sir, um, I feel that there are some words like uh, which has multiple meanings in uh, several languages, but in the same way. Suppose uh, the word Google. <coughs> uh, don't we use it? Uh, 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 I mean, uh, don't we mean uh, various uh, various things uh, and in different language in the same way? Like in French, Google means uh, what uh, the British also means the same, or the American. Uh, yes, yes. Am I clear? I, I, I... Yes, this is what we call loan word. In French, the Google word is not a French word. It has come from American English and infiltrated in most of our languages. So 
we have accepted i told you like computer 50 years ago we did not understand in the same way so google it has come as a new world now what happens in morphology we have accepted is a loan word as is used in english in a particular sense that sense we have accepted further what we have done for example no over google you can hear let us google over google in english let us google its own form with a zero morpheme has become a verb you make so the same way of that. Yeah, the same way it has come with tweeter j tweeted let tweet wala kam sa exact the most exact and if you look at indian languages google is still not a verb so it depends upon because how we use verb and verb making process in our language how google has become a verb it, it is a loan word because there is a no. but sir pardon sir but, but actually actually uh, in our uh, vernacular also uh, vernacular language uh, uh, there i have heard several people especially the youngest youngsters um, once uh, they use google uh, while they're speaking their own vernacular tongue like in bengali they are saying uh, oda google kore dak that means uh, you do it uh, by uh, googling uh, something exactly like that. what do you use google korota or something like that google itself has not become a verb in hindi it becomes in bengali also it becomes google it can become but what you have used that is the process of bengali verb formation process google and then you add korota or something like koro will be there after that you will add something so that is your verb formation yes. Yes, I got so, it. Yes. Yes. So pay attention to the verb formation process in your language. It will be different. And we have similar. For example, uh, a few uh, decades ago, there was a, a series, and it was based on a very famous novel, Kuru Kuru Swaha. So in that, there was Netaji, Netaji Kahin, Kaka Ji Kahin was the original, and Netaji Kahin, and they they would say telephonie. And it was on Doordarshan. The standard Hindi is supposed to be used. So it was on Doordarshan. Telephone ye. That is see, but telephone karo. These are two different processes of verb formation. This is what we are trying to understand. I am only trying to understand the principles. And the study of the principles is part of morphology. This is what we do in morphology. Accordingly, in French, you will find. there are many such processes so after having understood the words we will also see that there are two types of words one type of word which has clear reference if i say table you have a very clear reference something you can show that okay here it is table but google where will you show me google if i say democracy you cannot show me it is only in your concept so there are referent concepts there are concepts which are non referent concepts democracy does not you cannot show me where is democracy there are objects which you can show me there are ideas only even those objects are actually ideas only in a morphology we have to understand that's why speech and our mind we have to understand that when i say table or table or anything duvan you can show me that this is wine duvan but there are so many types of wines there are some wines which i have not yet even seen and i will tell that okay it looks like a wine so how do i know that it is it is a referent it has a reference some words not even have a reference some words have reference but when you have reference there also you don't refer to an object you refer to your own concept if i say tree arb there are so many types of arb what is common between the two we say om simply man now you see there are there are four five men here five six ten men here all of us are different but when somebody says man all of us are together represent women so each woman is different but when i say woman as a category then 
each one is different. You cannot show me that concept that I have. So this is also a part of morphology. We try to understand different types of words and how we correlate different types of words and word formations in a language. So this is much, this much is for the what is a word. There are two types of word. Very importantly, we must understand. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, I had a doubt. Um, when yes. you were saying about uh, Lavion, the Emprime, and uh, Boat Rapa, there uh, both the words are from French. Vion is also French word. Uh, Emprime is also French. I thought about Hindi. In Hindi, some words I thought where half of the word is from other language, and the second half is from other, like rail gadi. One is in English, other is in Hindi, and the one of the ancient word, if I recall, double roti. So what do you call to these words where double is uh, English and roti is Hindi, but <coughs> they become Hindi word. Okay. Is there any particular uh, form, uh, uh, any Absolutely. word uh, for these kind of words? And in French also, sir, does it exist? No. Yes, yes, it exists in every language, in fact. It exists in every language. You have kayak, it's a foreign word, and kayaking in English, okay? Kayake, we have added, kayake, when you go on kayak, uh, that rowing, then that is called kayaki. Actually, you know, in word formation process, the first we have said that there is a loan category called loan word. In every language, we have new words which come as a loan word. We accept it. Now, loan word becomes a native word. At what a stage? This is one of the tests that you have started making further words on the basis of your own language. So like rail gadi, double bread, okay? M many things you, suppose you see uh, uh, a, a very fat man sitting on the bus and you see that this man is occupying the space of two persons. So you say double man. Now here you see double man, ha it is not in English. The double and man both are English, but you have used it almost as your own language word. Okay. So this is one of the tests that when you start adding, deleting, etc., according to the morphemic juxtaposition principles of your own language, then the loan word actually becomes your own word. Okay. There are many such words. So this is one and it happens in every language. Okay. Many words, kamikaze, it's a French word, which came from Japanese, kamikaze, these uh, suicide uh, bombers and all that. So the, the kamikaze were the original pilots, suicide pilots of uh, Japanese army long ago, the Second World War, during World War times. So you can see this is a French word, kamikaze, of, French, of Japanese origin. Now, today it is used as a French word and you can find expressions like kamikaze for, for suicide bombing, many such words. So this is one of the tests that you are telling. Now, this means that the word rail has become our own word. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh -huh. Even sir, uh, rendezvous, French, uh, we say, I mean, rendezvous is also very commonly used now in English. Yes, yes, yes. Rendezvous is commonly used. Uh, not only rendezvous, many times I see that ahes uh, vepe, reponde silvu play. Now, what is a word? Because in English, you don't understand reponde silvu play. Okay, in French, it can be a, an acronym. But English, it is not an acronym. It has become a word. We have many such words that we use. UNESCO. It is an acronym, no doubt about it. But Without reference to uh, that acronym, we will in Hindi use UNESCO and we understand. So UNESCO refers to me a reality and that time I will not think of the acronym. I may not even know the acronym. Many Hindi speakers or Indian language speakers may not even know the acronym. All of them are not educated enough to know the acronym, but they will go and use the word. Anyone who is fitting the mic in a UNESCO event will only use the word UNESCO. So for him, UNESCO is part of that event. 
So that's why I said it, the words refer to the reality for you, the meaning that it creates for you. And that meaning may not be the same for me and for the some, someone else. We have to understand it contextually. If to an educated speaker like you all, I say, ONU, you will understand, or UNO, you will understand it in reference to the acronym. But many people will not understand it. But yet they will have a reference to it. Is it okay? Anything else? So what we have studied today in this section is basically what is a word, what are the word formation processes, and how these processes, these uh, morphine, morphemes which help us create words, both free and bound morphemes, how they help us create different categories of words also, like from noun to adjective, noun to adjective to adverb, etc., etc., from uh, plural to um, uh, making processes to uh, gender marking processes. And there are different types of morphemes, free morphemes and bound morphemes. And there is something called zero morpheme also, because it is not there. It is absent, yet the meaning has changed. So like in plural marking uh, in French language, mostly we use zero morpheme. Plural is marked. So that means some morphemic change has happened because it, it, it creates a different meaning, but it is not pronounced. So when it is not pronounced, so it is Can zero. you give an example, please? Of what? Of zero morphemes. Bon, petit in singular and plural. In French, every example of singular and plural is almost like that. Except for one example that I found that desert and enough. Now here you remove last for and then it becomes plural. And you identify it by whatever happens prior to the word un and desert. So of and of, but in French, mostly uh, plurals are made by zero marking morphemes. Okay. Any questions now? You should try to un understand what is a morpheme, what is a word. <clears throat> what are different types of words and what is uh, morphology? So the word uh, which uh, is mute, this can be considered as zero morphem? No. Any word which comes how in can word, How can a word be mute? A word, word cannot e, be mute. Uh, uh, arbor. On a la final E. No, no. See, no. some written alphabet can be mute that I discussed in the previous section today, in the first half. Don't go by uh, the written representation. Language is primarily spoken. And in writing, you represent it. There is nothing no. like mute. I understand. OK? And a word cannot be mute. In the written representation of some words, some cluster of letters may be pronounced in a particular manner. For example, a and te, how do you presume that te has to be pronounced? Maybe because you are thinking of English. But I told you that in French orthography, a and te, if it is at the end of the verb, it will not be pronounced. And if otherwise, then it will be on. So the, in French, what we do, we represent zero sound or we represent the sound on by a and te. A, n and any uh, consonant after that. So please don't confuse it with the English. That's where you get confused in French orthography. Otherwise, French orthographical rules are very clear. Many people in India, you will hear that French people write something else, they pronounce something else. No, this is not so at all. French orthographical and 
its equivalent phonological uh, relationship are much more systematic than in English. So please take this from your mind away that some letters are silent. You go by the speech and see the var varieties of ways that sound, that phonemic sound is represented by a combination of letters. So let us try to understand in this manner. Otherwise, you see somebody asked no, that a, a, u, these are three vowels. No, these are not. A, a, u is one vowel, is one phonemic sound. One phonemic sound being represented by three letters, which are not vowels. Otherwise, in French, we will not have 12 vowels. There are 12 vowels in French, not five. So please try to understand this. And there is, and a word cannot be silent because the very definition of word is a sequence of sounds when pronounced represents some meaning for you. So it has to be pronounced. Is it okay now? Uh, excuse me, sir. In the last, uh, uh, I mean, in the RPE chart that I saw, that there were 20 consonants and 16 vowels. Is it true? Is it correct? Yes, yes, that is correct. There, will, there okay. is more. There are 130 sounds okay. all together in the world. Okay. So when you see it, the entire RPE chart, mm -hmm. they refer to all the languages okay. of the world. Okay. So that's why I told you that you can refer to that, but there can be confusion. So go to the list given by standard dictionaries like Pati Rogar. Okay. In Pati Rogar, they will give you all okay. the sounds and its representations. Okay. So that is a much easier way for us because we are not poor students of linguistics. Exactly, exactly. We are students of French and we study linguistics that helps us in translation, that helps us in didactics, mostly in didactics, the way we have studied today. <laughs> and it helps us also in understanding uh, literature to some extent. So uh, our purpose is limited only to that. So that's Thank why you, I have not dealt with the entire IPA chart, which is itself a different uh, and a long topic. Merci. So, okay, the, the, this problem of uh, 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 alphabetical representation of sounds, I hope it is clear because otherwise you will face problems later. And in language, always pay attention to the speech. That is primary. A spoken language is primary. Okay, so anything else? Okay, thank you for all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.